This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Maggie DeGuardo, uh, Associate Medical Director of Cellular Therapy, the Impact Lab, which is the research arm of cellular therapy at Mayo Clinic. And she's also an attending in molecular genetic pathology oncology at, here at Mayo Clinic. And thanks for coming and joining us today, Dr. Guardo. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Guardo. Nice to be here. It's good to see you. You're coming right on the, the coattails. We had uh, your colleague, uh, Dr. Dietz, come and talk to us about uh, cellular therapy. And I really wanted to kind of pair uh, you know, your perspectives with his perspectives, uh, particularly because I think this is such a, a really innovative new area, given the fact that you are kind of wearing these multiple hats, you understand the, the clinical side of cellular therapy, as well as the research side. Uh, let's just kick it off with, you know, from your perspective, why is cellular therapy an important topic for our, our audience, our listeners to kind of have a little familiarity with, you know, these lab medicine pathologists, physicians, and students. Why is it, why is it important to appreciate cell therapy? Um, I think the easy answer to that is it's good for our patients. You know, it's safe. It's typically safe. It's typically very effective and it's really versatile. Um, so there aren't a lot of drugs out there that you can say that about, and it's good for our patients. And so ultimately that's what we work for whether you're in the lab or you're on the floor rounding on them or you're learning about them in the classroom, um, it's why we do what we do. So I think it's really, I think it's, and it's cool. So I think at the end of the day, you know, it's so interesting. So let's talk about it. I, I think let's underline that and highlight that for the listeners, right? It is cool. I think that's probably, I, you know, I asked the why question many times out of the gate, and I think that's the best answer so far <laughs> for everybody to check out. I, I think that uh, to riff on that, I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting you're pointing out is, you know, here's this this new therapeutic modality, and you know, physicians are used to looking at uh, pharmacology, and this this is really a, a new pharmacology. It sounds like that's evolving, and like what you're saying is, this is really um, there's a lot of uh, rigor built into this. And so there's opportunities for clinicians to uh, partner uh, with cellular therapy colleagues for projects, certainly students uh, for research this area. I can't even imagine what it's like <laughs> to kind of, you know, herd these research efforts into something that can, that can make progress. But yeah, I think probably at the end of the day, the best way to think about it is it, it's, it's just cool. So maybe, maybe we can pivot here and I can ask you, uh, you know, What's, since, since we're talking about cool, what, what's your origin story uh, for, for getting into this, this world of cellular therapy? Sure. Actually, I like this story quite a bit. So, and this takes me back to my patients, really, and why we do it. And uh, I was on call. So I was a clinical pathology resident, and I was in residency. So in second year, we take call, and it's terrifying um, when you first start <laughs> because you're in there on Saturdays and you're looking at all the peripheral smears. And for all of you CP, heme path people out there, you're terrified you're gonna miss a blast, right? And everything looks like a blast and they all, <laughs> all of a sudden everything looks the same. But I put my slide down, so it's just my second week. I put the slide down and even I could see, you know, just fulminant leukemia on this slide. And so I looked, I looked at my patient, it's an eight-year-old little girl, and I called the clinician and we had a long talk and I was, uh, had the privilege of talking to a clinician that was really willing to teach, even though I wasn't on his service. So it was fantastic. And I said, what are we going to do for this little girl? So it was recurrent. And he started talking about her options, transplant and this CAR T. And this was like 2014-ish, you know, um, so relatively new. And, and for our listeners, could you just, what is CAR-T before you go? Oh, sure. So CAR-T therapy is where, um, and it's been through multiple iterations now, but essentially it's where we are isolating T cells from the patient and we are engineering them to be exquisitely specific to the tumor cells in the patient's body. 
And so we take them and we collect them, we engineer them, it goes through an enormous amount of processing. And then we create a dose and we infuse them back into the patient. And those T cells are now designed to go and attack um, the B cells that are the problem, right? And so are the pathogenic B cells. And so it wipes them out. And then essentially the patient can kind of start from ground zero. They do go through, and they, this has been mitigated quite a bit, but there have been some clinical side effects, but they've been learning how to manage that. And like I said, the CAR T cells now, I think we're on our fourth generation. And we're even looking at dual specificities, which just speaks to the way this process is evolving, just at such a rapid pace. Um, but at the time, I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't know much about our transplant program either. And so I immediately asked for, uh, to use one of my electives to rotate through our cell therapy lab, which is on a much smaller scale um, than it is here at the Mayo Clinic, but you know, the same nonetheless. And so that was really kind of the first experience I had uh, that also allowed me to understand that this cellular therapy, that cellular therapy is a marriage. It's this marriage of clinical and laboratory medicine that I love. So that's kind of how I got into it. And then I got here and obviously uh, the story has unfolded through multiple trainings and fellowships. <laughs> uh, and now I have the privilege of working with some of the greatest minds in the field, to be honest, so. <laughs> That's so cool. So, so uh, you know, one of the things that kind of struck me as you were talking and sharing that story is just this this rapid uh, pace of advancement. And in fact, I was just on a Grand Rounds, transplant Grand Rounds yesterday, and somebody was talking about, you know, in the last 10 years, they've had two new treatments for uh, the condition they were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, this this pace is a lot faster than that. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, I imagine that there's some really um, unique challenges, or I guess I like to think of them as opportunities. <laughs> so can you share with us, um, you know, from your perspective, working in such a uh, fast paced area, it certainly, um, you know, is coming on board in this area. What, what's been really kind of a unique challenge uh, that you've had to navigate and how, how have you done that? Yeah, that's good. I, <laughs> I like um, I like the use of the word challenge and fast pace. But so I think I'm going to just say that I'm going to look at everything as an opportunity, even the decisions that I, I think I wish that I would or that I know retrospectively that I would I would do differently because that's also an opportunity to learn. Um, but I think you nailed it. The fast paced environment of this or the, the way this is growing and expanding and um, keeping up with it is certainly a challenge because uh, because it is so versatile. So that being said, I think one of the other challenges is the diversity. Um, the, the clinical indications for which we target or which we use cell therapies to target are just incredible. You're looking at stuff, uh, you're looking at treating um, regrowing cartilage and arthritic knees with MSCs to targeting you know, tumor antigens with dendritic cells and glioblastoma, to literally repopulating a patient's bone marrow with hematopoietic stem cells. So it's just, I think some of the challenges are really understanding the clinical needs and then how do we provide a, a drug that's gonna be effective and keeping up, with, keeping up with that. So I think the pace is really the biggest challenge. So I wanna dig into this a little bit. Um, uh, one thing that I know that's a challenge, having talked with a lot of other attendings, uh, you know, in in pathology is and outside is, is keeping up with the literature. And so, you know, uh, that seems like for you know many of the hats that you're kind of wearing, and you know, there's deadlines on many things. But uh, you know, once you're out of training, there's not really the deadline about you know have you have you read your cellular therapy journal for this month or have you kept up with the recent articles? Um, how how have you approached keeping up with the literature? Um, have you figured out a, a way of you know setting some kind of calendar reminder or have you? Uh, been able to kind of set uh, alert for new papers or talking with colleagues? What's What's been your strategy? So my honest answer is that my strategy is evolving. <laughs> um, but, and this is, this is, I think, a challenge for every clinician, right? Um, 
a couple of things that I would say that are really, I found really useful. So conferences, um, obviously I love the conferences, uh, but then also I try to spend a half an hour a day going through an article. I really do. Um, that is hard. It's hard to sit down and stay focused on it, but I try to spend as much time, uh, it, or not as much time, but I try to make it consistent. That's what I would say, is be consistent. Um, you know, short of waiting for them to become, you know, to come out on Audible, I'm not really sure how I could, <laughs> I would love for somebody to read me these papers while I'm driving to and from work. So that's my ask out there in case anybody's really listening. Um, but I really try to be consistent. And also, I will say that as my projects come along, so we get new requests all the time. And I try to do an, an, uh, an initial and although um, abbreviated lit search, and I really, and I start to, I start to organize them. And I think organization is the key. So that has helped tremendously. So using um, EndNote or even just the PubMed files, I have an enormous amount of organization um, within my PubMed account. And so that way they're easily accessed and I can continuously go back to them. But, you know, I'd say if you can do 20 minutes a day, that's, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good answer. There are probably better ways out there. <laughs> I, I think that's a brilliant answer. And, and I really appreciate your honesty uh, with this idea of, uh, you know, this is an iterative uh, process uh, and this is evolving and you're constantly, to me, that, that shows me that, you know, you're, you're constantly learning, right? And, mm -hmm. and not getting stuck in one way or another way. Because certainly if, if we get stuck in the mud and we just continue to spin our wheels, uh, you know, it's time to go get the kitty litter out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and can I just say one thing, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but something that I was thinking about. When I first started uh, doing my literature searches, I used to think about, can I, I really want to know this paper inside and out. I want to be able to, I want to be able to just, you know, give back all this information, right? I want to be able to quote the, the sensitivity and the specificities, and I want to be able to name the authors, and I want to be able to do all of that. And that's not actually the most important part, right? For me, my first look at these papers is concepts, okay? And really understanding the big idea. And then eventually I get into the weeds and the details, but remembering the author's names, if, while very important, that's not what I realize my goal has to be upfront. Uh, just knowing that my resources are out there. I think knowing what your resources are is your most important piece. Cause when you get the question, you're gonna know where to find the answer. I think that was really uh, wonderful, probably for our listeners to hear, because I'm sure all of us have colleagues that are like the walking encyclopedia that can just yeah. drop drop names <laughs> and uh, you know pull out yep. papers uh, in an in an impressive way. Yes. And uh, for the rest of us mere mortals, uh, right. I think I think it's just a, a beautiful way to say that you know uh, stop and think about what's your goal. And I certainly I. I I see your your wisdom in when you're starting out a lit search. It's really, what's this concept that they're talking about, and and then later it's how did they test it and such. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really keen for our listeners to to kind of peg on. I, I want to kind of close with uh, you know one of the challenges I thought about as I was talking with um, your colleague Dr. Dietz and then you now and, and just there's all this potential for cellular therapy and I think that. You know, it just becomes this. You know, it's 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 everything. But then it's so hard to get our arms around it. Um, but I'm curious, right? You're you're in this field. Uh, you know, I'm curious for just let's tag one thing, and you know, what direction? What is one direction you see this field of cellular therapy uh, moving over these next five years? Because there might be some listeners that this is the thread that kind of uh, is their entry point to cellular therapy. Oh, good. No pressure there. Thanks for that one. <laughs> so, um, with their with our med students' futures on the line, future careers here on the line. Um, so, I actually have to laugh when you say, "What's the one direction that you see cellular therapy going in?" <laughs> no, what is one? Not is what one. Because like, I see about a thousand, and right now I've got the paper strewn all over my desk to prove it. So. Um, Boy, that is, I, I, 
I don't have I don't have a good answer because I think it's going to move in so many directions. And I think at the end of the day, I, I think, uh, OK, from a non scientific perspective, from a non indication perspective, because I think you're going to see it really become even more targeted right for these for these um, uh, leukemias and lymphomas. And I think you're really going to start. I think the specificity of the targets is going to just become so nuanced and exquisite. Um, and, and I think the other piece of this that we haven't really talked about moving past the scientific aspect, I think it's going to become much more available, right? I think that this is going to become a common part of the conversation when you're discussing therapeutic options with your patients. And the fact is, is that while we are, while we have the privilege of, of, of practicing here at the Mayo Clinic with the resources and the you know, surrounded by just a plethora of, of knowledge, at the end of the day, um, I'm sorry, resources, really, at the end of the day, I think it's going to become more applicable and, and, and more a part of mainstream medicine. That's what I think. Um, and so I think it, you better get on board because it's really <laughs> it's coming. So, okay, there's two ways we've just circled this, come full circle in this interview back to the why, right? We've reiterated the cool factor, but then also this component of, you know, this is really going to be going mainstream and this will be available. And it makes me think about, you know, 10 plus years ago when I was getting into pathology, I remember interviewing with people, um, you know, well, I had an interest in molecular and people were saying, oh yeah, you know, in the near future, you're just going to have to speak molecular. That's yeah. that's going to be a component of life. Uh, you know, when we're talking about cancers, uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. not going to be enough to say that it's, you know, acute leukemia. It's, you know, what are these uh, mutations yeah. are, are just going to be profound. And I think what you're really bringing us full circle to is that, you know, right now, cellular therapy might be this sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, very, um, uh, not as widely available, but very talked about, you know, some people might even say hyped, uh, but, you know, in, in, as the future rolls out, you really are, are forecasting that this is going to become a uh, commonly available uh, product yeah. uh, or options, you know, maybe like a, a red cell transfusion. Right. There you go. I mean, look at that. That's like, that is, that is the origin right there of cell therapy. Well, you just watch, we're going to save this clip <laughs> and, you know, five, 10 years, we're going to be like predicted here by Dr. DeGuardo. <laughs> so great experiment. <laughs> We've been rounding with Dr. Maggie DeGuardo. Thank you so much for taking uh, the time to discuss cell therapy with us. I, th I think, Dr. Gordo, you really gave us a flavor for what this is. You, you've started to help us get our arms around this, this challenging topic, and uh, you, you've really uh, brought it back to the cool factor. Thanks for having me. It's always good to see you. So thanks for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any questions uh, or suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations.